long before the days of If only there was someone out there who loved you. And well before That was his mistake. Disney was the king of villains, as well as villain songs. Then after Mother Gothel, they just decided that they were too good for musical ham sandwiches that would turn Broadway on its heel. So with that said, I feel it's important to highlight all the great villain songs out there in various mediums. First up, non-Disney movies. Let's be honest, everyone has done a Disney villain songs list, and we all know which one is gonna top it. That's right. Like a treasure from a sunken pirate wreck. Been watching way too much Shay for the list. Can you blame me? His videos are good. Anywho, the rules for this list, as well as for everything else in this themed month, are pretty straightforward. No fan remixes. These have to be official. These have to have lyrics, which unfortunately disqualifies a ton of video game songs. So, unfortunately, no dancing mad. While these are villain songs, they don't necessarily have to be sung by the villain themselves. They can also be sung about the villain or be an artistic representation sung from the villain's point of view. As for how we'll be judging these songs, there are a few different metrics. How deliciously evil does the villain sound? How intimidating is the villain? How well does it help us understand who the villain is as a character? And while not this month, eh, who knows? Maybe someday I might do an actual Disney villain song list. We'll see what happens down the line. Either way, welcome to Villain Songs Month. Yeah, I, I couldn't come up with a clever name, but let's get into it. Am I evil? Yes, I am. You know, guys, I had the weirdest dream last night. Captain Marvel and Superman were fighting the boyfriend from Juno over royal pain from Sky High. Oh, sorry. I was just Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. Weird premise, yeah, but what do you expect when you're talking about Scott Pilgrim vs. the World? The 2010 live-action movie about a band leader trying to defeat his crush's seven evil ex-boyfriends. Exes. Based on the graphic novel of the same name. Yeah, let's not kid ourselves, this is a weird premise. Anyways, while this movie is known for having a pretty stellar soundtrack with different songs throughout, the one I want to focus on is Black Sheep. When Scott and Ramona go to a club to watch Clash at Demon Head's gig, the song starts and this happens. <laughs> Ramona remarks that the guy on bass is her third ex and vegan extraordinaire, Todd Ingram. While Scott is surprised by that, he's not as surprised when he sees that the lead singer is his own ex, Natalie Envy Adams. Envy starts singing and you can tell there's some hostility in the air from all participants. Scott, who dated Envy, was dumped by her, started dating Knives and then broke up with her to date Ramona, is going through a roller coaster of regret as he realizes that what Envy did to him, he's doing to others for his own benefit. Look at the lyrics. Throughout the song, you can see Todd and Envy looking and singing right at our two main heroes. And you don't need the Michael Sarah patented deer in the headlights look to see that Scott realizes how similar he and Envy actually are when it comes to their relationships. The song plays on how Scott toys with girls for his own benefit. While he may not think he is doing it on purpose, he still is. Scott is taking a bull ride of emotion with Envy, Knives, and Ramona, and in the end, he'll be left feeling alone and empty. While it isn't until much later in the movie that he realizes this, the foreshadowing that starts here is still impactful, even if it's a little undercut by the fight between Scott and Brandon Ruth playing a fake super vegan right after. Todd and Envy aren't major villains in the story. 
Heck, Envy doesn't even play as much of a role as she does in the graphic novel. Which honestly kind of sucks. I mean, come on, wouldn't you rather hear her singing rather than playing Super Saiyan Goddess with the personality of a broom? But considering the theme of the song and how it works for Scott's character, it was a good entry to start our month on. Now it should be all uphill from here, right? Right? Please, someone tell me I'm right. tell you about this one really good animated movie. It features a cast of anthropomorphic animals in an urban setting, the protagonist of which is a young idealist who wants to make a difference in the world. They're forced to confront the harsh reality of their world, but ultimately manage to achieve their goals. Subtextually, the whole story is a metaphor for race relations in certain microcosms of society. That's right, it's time to talk about Cats Don't Dance. What the For those unaware, Cats Don't Dance is an animated movie about the golden age of Hollywood circa 1920s and 30s. It stars a group of lower class animals who are desperate to finally get starring roles in major motion pictures. Gee, I wonder what that could be a metaphor for. And in this animal focused movie, we have our human villain, Darla Dimple. She can be best described as the unholy love child of Dolores Umbridge and Carmelita Spatz that stole Cozy Glow's wig. On camera, she's America's sweetheart and the kind of girl you just want to take home with you. You know, the Olsen twins, the Shirley Temple, that sort of thing. Off camera, she's a complete and utter narcissist who abhors the very idea of not being in the spotlight. This is best shown through her villain song, Big and Loud. Like many other villain songs, Big and Loud has a reprise, each of them showing a different side of Darla. You start off with a more theatrical and pleasant version where she tells Danny about how to make it in show business. You gotta be noticeable, make sure all eyes are on you, and the best way to do that is to be big and loud, like early 2010s YouTube. Danny, being the naive, nice guy he is, completely buys it. Once he leaves, we get the real villain song from Darla. As I said earlier, many villain songs excel in showing off the villain and explaining their motives and this is one of them. Yes, she does say earlier in the movie that she hates animals, but that speciesism oddly takes a back seat to her ruthlessness, greed, and narcissism. I didn't get The song escalates to a gloriously over-the-top imaginary spot as Darla pictures her victory over Sawyer and Danny. The animation is just as dark but fluffy as she is, and the whole sequence matches her personality and villainy perfectly. It's the combination of Golden Age Hollywood composition and the sheer diabolical...ism that makes this one a winner. Unfortunately, Big and Loud isn't any higher on this list due to the fact that it's regrettably short. Both the original and the reprise clock in at under two minutes. With that said, it uses every second it can spare to its absolute fullest. Yes, Allow me to paint a picture for you. You're an overbearing, kinda negligent parent and your kids are committing the worst sacrilege of all. Saying naughty words they learned from a movie. Oh, just lock him up and throw away to jail. Oh, but it gets worse. One of the kids ends up dying, imitating a dangerous feat they saw in the movie. So what do you do? Do you sue the doctors for legitimate malpractice? Or do you admit you should have taught your kids better like a responsible... <laughs> no. I've said before that when South Park takes a few steps back from the crass, vulgar humor, their satire can be pretty dang funny and insightful. And for their first feature film, they tackled a subject that, unfortunately, isn't going away. Morality bullies versus art. It's taken many forms. Jack Thompson from a decade ago, people throwing tantrums over George Carlin. Heck, this has gone all the way back to Socrates. One of the many common manifestations of this attitude in the present day is Karen parents versus the media. Kyle's mom rallies the parents of South Park to basically declare war on Canada for creating the Terrence and Phillip movie and morally corrupting the children. Yeah, cause the guy who fed Scott Tenerman's parents to him and admitted it in public was always such a precious angel. 
But in this movie, Kyle's mom is by far a bigger danger. Even going so far as to threaten the Canadian Prime Minister, start a war, and kill Terrence and Philip when she doesn't get her way. And because it's South Park, they escalate things through song as the parents march through town with their anti-Canada propaganda. And I'll be danged if it isn't one of the catchiest hissy fits around. Like most of South Park's satire, the best part of this song comes from the writing, particularly these last set of lyrics. That alone paints a clear picture of what makes the song funny. It's not purely a cheap jab at Canada, it's a cheap jab at the parents who can't take responsibility for what their children consume. It's self-righteous, it's tyrannical, and I can't not sing along when I hear it. If it was good enough for Robin Williams to perform at the Academy Awards, it's good enough for this list. Well, time to bring the brony back out of the closet. I have been locked in there for 30 months! The Equestria Girls specials are harmless. While there's a lot to enjoy, there's nothing particularly groundbreaking other than, oh, look, ponies are humans now. The villains here are the uh, best. A lot of these are good ideas. It just seems like they weren't allowed to go all the way and were restrained by the clunky world building. With three major exceptions. Oh yes, it's the Dazzlings. These three kidified Heathers flaunt their way into the second Equestria Girls movie and they waste no time staging their takeover. Bringing out and feeding off of everyone's negative emotion using only their angelic velvety voices. That's actually what makes them the best baddies in the spinoff, even among the best in the franchise. They stay proactive in their goal and they nearly pull it off. All three other songs in the movie are great, but the one that really stands out to me. Now that you're under our spell. At this point, the Dazzling's plan is in full swing, and this haunting pop perfectly highlights everything. The trio has the crowd eating out of their hands, tensions are rising as the Battle of the Bands rages on, and Twilight and the main six, seven, whatever, are slowly cracking under the pressure. All the while, the Dazzlings are reveling in the fact that they're in complete control of all the cards, and they're publicly bragging about it to everyone's faces, and everyone's too hyper-competitive and volatile to notice. It's so genius. Blindsided by the beat, clapping your hands, stomping your feet. You didn't know that you fell. Oh, now you're falling under a spell. Oh. At the end of the day, however, let's be real. The Dazzlings themselves are more or less magically glorified Mean Girls rejects with the musical flair of Winifred from Hocus Pocus, especially with their take over the world motivations being a wee bit standard. But that's not the reason the Dazzlings are so beloved. It's not the why, it's the how. The fact that they're competent in their goals and that they turn a Disney tween pop tune into a menacing claim to fame more than justifies their place on this list. Besides, like I said, it's my inner brony speaking. I am what I am. It's no secret that I love Tim Burton's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. While the songs aren't exactly as memorable as the classics, there are a lot less of them this time around and each one manages to stand out in its own way. Danny Elfman had his work cut out for him as each song represented a different song genre, from Bollywood to psychedelic pop to... Poetry. But by far, my all-time favorite tune from the movie would have to be Mike TV's Oompa Loompa song. From the first time he showed up on screen, this movie built this smug little punk up as the most rotten kid in the group. 
He's destructive, disrespectful, and ever so slightly sociopathic, combined with an incredible intelligence. That is a recipe for disaster. He didn't even come to the factory because he liked chocolate. Why did he come? To test the limits of my ability. So when it's time for his Oompa Loompa Doopity roasting, they go all out with a trippy, hard glam rock spectacle. The music is perfectly fast paced and chaotic and the visuals are a smorgasbord of color and hilarious references. Once again, major props to Deep Roy for doing the work of a thousand men and going through so many costumes to pull this off. The true icing on the cake? The lyrics for the song come straight out of the book. That's right, Mr. Burton wanted to do so much justice to the source material that he included lyrics from the actual songs in the novel and gave them a fitting modern twist. I think the only real nitpick about that though is that it really highlights Roald Dahl's hypocritical anti-TV agenda a little too much. In this case though, it works brilliantly in helping to cut Mike down to size even more. Top it off with a hilarious punchline and you've got the best song in the film dedicated to the worst brat of the bunch. Yes, huh, we're on the second half of the list. I guess that means we're playing with the big boys now? The Prince of Egypt is an animated movie that came out back in 1998, telling the story of Moses freeing the Jews from the Egyptians. Most people who grew up in Judeo-Christian households know the story of Moses. He was an adopted Prince of Egypt, found out he was actually Jewish, became a prophet when God spoke to him from a burning bush, and spent a good many years trying to free his people from Pharaoh Ramses' rule, eventually succeeding only for them to mess up so bad that they have to wander the desert for 40 years. <laughs> eh, win some, lose some. Well, considering what Moses was asking, you could say there was some hostility, to put it mildly, from Ramses. While in this version of the events, Ramses considers Moses his long lost brother, the second he starts professing the name of his new god and asking for the Jews to be freed, Ramses doesn't take it well. Ramses feels betrayed by his brother and resents that he only returned to free slaves instead of returning as family, freeing slaves that Ramses was conditioned from a young age to see only as tools for a great legacy. However, Moses tries to prove his point by showing off the power of his god with the transformation of his staff into a snake. Well, Egypt has many gods of their own and Ramses asks his court sorcerers Hotep and Hoy to give them their response. You're playing with the big boys now. You're playing with the big boys now. Stop this foolish mission. What's a true magician? Give an exhibition how. Pick up your silly twig boy. Listing off the gods and making them rhyme is one thing. But Hoy and Hotep's whole thing is using illusions and theater tricks to convince the crowd that their gods are the true ones. By using light, smoke, and mirrors, they were able to turn their own scepters into snakes. By the might of Horus, you will kneel before us, kneel to our splendorous power. It's kind of funny since they know that their magic is all spectacle compared to Moses' actual miracle, but they show so much pride that even the real stuff is still below their talents. I still find it funnier that Martin Short and Steve Martin are the voices and singers behind these two. The snark and condescension that those two are known for plays perfectly in this song. In the end, the crowd goes for the magicians and Moses is stuck turning his snake back into a staff and leaving in defeat. While he wins in the end and he didn't succumb to their taunts here, Moses had no choice but to retreat, giving Ramses a satisfied smile at the end. That's the great thing with villain songs when you use them to attack the protagonist. If it makes your point and gets under the hero's skin, you win that round, even if you might not win the war. And it just goes to show that real power isn't gonna cut it if you don't have presentation. <laughs> Every YouTuber in YouTubesville liked this song a lot, but the Josh, who carried a critical perception, also did. Come on, it's the Grinch! Everyone has a favorite holiday jam, and arguably one of the most universally praised is the slinking, devious, self-deprecating earworm, 
You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch. Naturally, I'm talking about the original sung by Tony the Tiger himself, Thurl Ravenscroft. His naturally deep voice adds a zesty, oozing feeling that really complements the sneaking, slithering tempo of the music. And the lyrics? Pure, savage poetry. Every verse seems to outdo itself in creativity with its insults and metaphors. Just listen to what we're working with. I wouldn't touch you with a 39 and a half foot pole. You have all the tender sweetness of a seasick crocodile, Mr. Grinch. You're a three-decker sauerkraut and toadstool sandwich with arsenic sauce. Insults this creative can only come from Dr. Seuss himself, and they mercilessly paint the Grinch as the most disgusting monstrosity on the face of the earth. And of course, the Grinch takes all of this verbal abuse with a termite-infested smile. Obviously, the original song is the one to beat, but how do the other movie versions compete? The Jim Carrey version is definitely a lot of fun and very memorable, but in comparison to the previous one, Maybe there's such a thing as too much cheesiness. And coming from a cheese lover like me, that's really painful to admit. The 2018 version is... Eh, it has a nice beat, but I don't really think the tune translates very well as a rap song. But what do you expect? It seemed like everything in that movie was just kind of... off. So yeah, there's no contest, the OG triumphs overall. Anyone who can't appreciate this deliciously wicked tune must have a heart that's two sizes too small. You may have noticed I neglected to mention the version on Glee. That was intentional. It's not controversial to say that Don Bluth is at his best when he's free to put whatever insanity crosses his mind onto the big screen. The Secret of Nim, All Dogs Go to Heaven, An American Tale, and The Land Before Time are all classics, and all of them are much darker than conventional animation. But twice upon a time, there were attempts by Bluth to mimic the wildly successful Disney-style animated musical. They even had princesses. Unfortunately, they weren't up to the quality of his previous work, and they didn't even particularly look like a Don Bluth production. One was the thoroughly annoying and incredibly strange Thumbelina. The other was Anastasia, which did give us three things. The first is the Bartok the Magnificent movie, an honestly underrated direct-to-video title that has the blue flare in spades. The second is a surprisingly good Broadway adaptation. And the third is what we're here to talk about, In the Dark of the Night. songs come in all shapes and sizes, from the quiet and contemplative, to the loud and bombastic, to the darkly seductive. In the Dark of the Night falls somewhere between the latter two. This is achieved with the use of what's now known as symphonic metal, a genre of music birthed from gothic metal and death metal and was pioneered by bands like Therian and Nightwish shortly after Anastasia was created. The song is sung by Rasputin an undead Russian wizard who was brought back from beyond the grave for a single purpose, to destroy the Romanov family. Unfortunately for him, a single member of that family managed to survive his purge. The solution? Sing about how he's gonna finish his vengeance to his bug minions, of course. Oh, it's so obvious. I would have never thought of that. The song, performed by Jim Cummings, filling in for Christopher Lloyd, is delightfully wicked and has the bug minions singing as a backup chorus. Let me tell you, I was not expecting a deep, booming voice from an insect. There's honestly not much to analyze about this song. The whole thing is basically, I'm a villain and loving it, and I want to kill this person. But it's done in such an epic and entertaining way that it's hard to ignore. The only minor negative to this song is that sometimes the lyrics can be, well, Awkward. Nevertheless, In the Dark of the Night is a fantastic gothic thriller type song, like something Alice Cooper would come up with pre-conversion. It feels dark and powerful, even if it can be a touch awkward. But that's also part of the song's charm. Some days I feel that Anastasia wouldn't be remembered at all if not for this song, and that says quite a bit. It's hard to imagine in this day and age, but the original Shrek was a massive game changer when it first came out. 
At the time, the idea of a movie that took the mick out of all the cliches that audiences were getting tired of was novel. Then Imitators and the Third led the whole thing to become a joke. Then even Disney started to get in on it, and now everything has to be meta. It seems like we can't have stories without the cast stopping the cinema sense itself or other similar stories every 10 minutes. To this day, Shrek is often blamed for all the obnoxious cliches we see in animated movies, especially for kids. You either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. For a while, the only thing the franchise was known for was the unique fan content it spawned. Over the last few years, however, people have begun to take another look at the Shrek movies and discover that they were a lot more intelligent than we originally gave them credit for. In particular, Shrek 2 is praised for being one of DreamWorks' best movies. Among the menagerie of things it nailed is its villain, the Fairy Godmother. And like many great villains, she has an absolute banger of a villain song, holding out for a hero. Hit it! <laughs> Let's get the obvious thing out of the way first. Is it a cover? Yes. Is it absolutely amazing? Also yes. Seriously, this is the version that most people think of nowadays when it comes to this song, and some consider it even better than the original. Did you know that the original Bonnie Tyler version was about hoping for a date? Me neither. Holding out for a hero is pretty unique compared to other villain songs on here. Despite being sung by the villain, it's very much told from the perspective of the heroes. And that really fits the tone of Shrek, doesn't it? The stereotypical villain is the hero. The ones you think would be heroes are the villains. A song about needing heroes is sung by the villain. Anyways, this song absolutely slaps. The cover is a gorgeously epic orchestral remix that definitely sells the stakes our characters are in. And the lyrics fit so well with the situation that you'd swear it was written for this movie. In fact, I know Ari didn't realize it was a cover until maybe about a decade after she saw the movie. This song perfectly cements what makes Shrek 2 work. It's just the right combination of funny, epic, and emotional, and it hits all the right notes. As I said earlier, the Shrek franchise is a lot more clever than you may remember, and stuff like this proves it. At least until the reboot comes out and ignores what made everything great. At least you still have the musical, that's still good. Sorry Shrek fellas, I'm gonna fight you on that! It's payback time, Adventures of Br'er Rabbit. Sneaking and swinging seem to fit together like a glove. A crooked man, babes in Toyland. A crooked, slithering melody by a very crooked man in a really weird movie. The Money Cat, Gay Puree, Everybody Digs a Swinging Cat. Pretty Bird, Rio, Tomatoa from Moana in a scary rapping mambo. Toxic Love, Fern Gully. It's like Tim Curry was custom made for these hammy villain roles. Open Up Your Eyes, My Little Pony the Movie. Emily Blunt belting out a haunting, degrading taunt with a hint of troubling backstory. Welcome to the Brony community. Sweet Transvestite, Rocky Horror Picture Show. Further proof that Tim Curry can always make a shiver with anticipation. I know some people might question my number one, and I don't blame you. Many have told me it might be cheating, and I can see that. However, I'm keeping it here for two reasons. One, it still qualifies under all my conditions. Two, we were freaking robbed of this masterpiece. This is a song on the level of hellfire, and I mean that absolutely sincerely. It's actually partially what inspired me to start this month's theme to begin with. And now without further ado, I present to you the best non-Disney movie villain song from a villain of his own story. I know what you're thinking. Really? Something from Illumination's The Lorax on the level of Hellfire? Well, let me explain. 
this song was only released on the official soundtrack, along with other songs that didn't make the cut. From these unreleased songs and some early concept artwork, it's plain to see that the Lorax movie by Illumination started out as something very different. Something darker. The Wunzler apparently had a lot more agency. He wasn't pressured by his family to be successful, he wanted success on his own. And he was good at it. He never tried to hurt anything at the start, but at some point, it stopped simply being about trying to get by or just doing something that he loved. It became about getting as big as possible. And that's where this song really shines. It's easy to blame greed for the Wunzler's behavior. Any other song would blame greed or even innocuous carelessness. But no, this song goes deeper to the source. But, you know, you really can't blame greed. No, that's stupid. You see, it's got a worm inside. Oh yeah, that's right. That's one that always needs to feed and it is never satisfied. You get it? But the more you try to find it, the more it likes to hide. Now listen, that is a nasty little worm. I like to call it pride. That's why the Wunzler continues to cause suffering. All that success, all the adoration, all the comfort, everything he's earned, he's so caught up in himself that he doesn't stop. He doesn't acknowledge the carnage because he sees himself as above all the ones he's hurting. They don't matter. He matters because he's successful and he's him. That's how pride gets you. Whether by suffering or by my self-worth, I'm me. Therefore, I deserve this thing. And the clincher? This song, while still condemning the Wunzler's actions, it doesn't write him off as a cartoonishly evil villain. You still see the humanity in his decisions and it's easy to see yourself falling into his mindset. That's the beauty of the Lorax and Biggering. We can quickly judge and write off greedy corporations for causing immense harm, but it never starts out that way. Once you put yourself through their same journey to get to a successful spot, you barely notice all the little internal justifications and excuses to keep doing the harmful things that you do. Behind the over-the-top rock opera and chorus, the song still treats the Wunzler with the seriousness he deserves by getting to the root of the problem, the human condition. There's a reason why pride is called the original sin after all. And because the Wunzler believes he deserves more, because he continues to take more than he needs, because his pride won't let him stop, he inflicts all of this pain and destruction and doesn't care when it's under the shadow of his glorious success. Some days, I cannot believe that this song exists. It goes for the throat and shows that when anyone takes more than what they need and justifies taking more and more without giving anything back, this could be you. Given the opportunity, everyone has the potential to become the Wunzler and do terrible things. Now, those familiar with the actual movie might have noticed they butchered this song's lyrics and added them to what we actually got. So, let me put this in perspective for you. Instead of a Pink Floyd rock opera Lorax with a dark villain song exploring the nature of greed and pride and the human condition, we got... How bad can I be? I'm just building the economy. I'm the Fiery Joker and we were robbed.
Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragon Fighter Gaming for tabletop, and Pop Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching.